Man, Doctor Who sure has had a lot of them cartoon thingies, hasn't it? Let's analyze them. I don't know, I can't think of a better pre-titles for this video. Hey there! So, as something of an amateur animation myself, I naturally find myself interested in the- Oi! Get out of here! I don't have the patience to painstakingly animate you for an entire okay, video- Okay, okay, geez, sorry. I'll get out of your non-existent hair. If you're not careful, I will cut yours too. So, as something of an amateur animator myself, I naturally find myself interested in the times when Doctor Who has explored the CG realm. 2D, 3D, webcasts, DVD animations, video games. It's had an interesting and chaotic journey in this field. Now, I'm not an elitist. You don't have to have practiced or studied animation to determine the quality of one. Just like how you don't need to know how to cook in order to determine how well a meal tastes. That's kind of dumb logic. But I have low self-esteem and I'd like to pretend like my education actually amounts to something, so... But yeah, since the dawn of the millennium, Doctor Who has dabbled in a fair amount of animated projects in various styles, and I feel like analysing all the significant ones and rating them. By the way, this doesn't include VFX work from the live-action TV episodes themselves. Like, I don't particularly feel like going, WOW, THAT DALEK SAUCER IS VERY NICELY RENDERED, about six or seven times in a row for every revival Dalek story, or analysing that goddamn shot from the Doctor's wife of the TARDIS in flight, which they recycled for like every series trailer ever. Nah. What I'm talking about in these videos are all side projects to the TV show. All their missing episode animations. Also, I'm focusing specifically on the animation of these projects, not the narrative content, so bear that in mind and strap in. So we're doing this in chronological order, which means we're starting with the webcasts by BBC I, and already I kind of want to die. Death comes to time and real time. Ugh, these barely even count. If anything, they're glorified comic books. I mean, kudos, the illustrations of the characters are relatively decent. They are recognisably the 6th and 7th Doctors and their respective supporting characters, even if Sixie looks downright demonic at some points. And the application of colour is really eye-catching and appealing. Sixie's blue coat looks really nice. But when we consider the actual animation, the character movement of these two projects, yeah, there is none. As I said, they are basically glorified comic books. The characters stay locked in position almost all of the time, with almost no movement against the backgrounds, and no limb or head movement or even lip syncing to the dialogue. The backgrounds aren't the worst thing in the world, but they are pretty generic looking for my tastes, and a lot of the scene transitions consist of sluggish and off-putting fades. I confess I've never even watched these all the way through, their presentation style just isn't my thing. I'd rather listen to the CD of real time, thank you very much. Sharda 2003 is also a BBC I webcast, which thankfully sees marginal improvement in some areas, but it's still just kind of gross. Well, at least they've discovered that they can pan and zoom the camera, and even move characters around the screen, and sometimes they even bother to animate limb and head movements. That's certainly a step forward. Unfortunately though, some of the aesthetics have taken a step back. The backgrounds are somehow even worse, they just look kinda sloppily done, and sometimes the characters are just superimposed over a tacky background gradient. And speaking of the characters, some of their artwork looks decent while others just look… wrong. Is there any reason why Skagra has such a squashed head? And the Krogs just look terrible, I'm sorry they do. I can get down with the reinvented molten aesthetic of them, but you definitely need a better budget to decently pull it off. At least Eight and Romana look relatively passable. Well, most of the time. Again, I've never seen this one all the way through either, I'd rather just listen to the full length CD version of Megan Sharda. But, as I said, the animation is a slight improvement. It's less a glorified comic book and more a PowerPoint presentation, and, you know, that's something, I guess. 
And also the Kylie dance video is the most canon 8th Doctor story, fight me. One more webcast, and thankfully it's easily the best of them. Considering this was, for a brief time, intended to be the grand next evolution of Doctor Who, before the revival turned up and invalidated it, I imagine that BBC I really wanted to make a decent and strong impression this time around. Well, by the standards of online 2003 Flash animations anyway. With the assistance of Cosgrove Hall, they gave a scream of the Schalke, with a brand new Doctor at the helm. And the animation is actually pretty decent? Like, wow, there's actual character movement this time around. They emote and blink and have mouth movements with possible lip syncing and everything. By today's standards, it's not particularly groundbreaking, but considering the capabilities of Flash around that time, as well as the previous efforts, I can definitely cut this some slack. They do cut a few corners with silhouettes doubling for characters in some shots, but considering the moody atmosphere of the adventure, it works well and presents a distinctive stylistic choice. The backdrops and visual effects like lens flares aren't much to write home about, but they serve their purpose, and whenever the story has unpleasant moments like the Schalke worms in people's foreheads, the artwork sells it gruesomely well. The Schalke themselves are well depicted here too, their designs are pretty cool, and I can imagine a live action depiction of them. Like the prior webcasts, the frame rate is a little choppy, but you know, 2003 flash animation, what do you expect? At least the scene transitions are much better timed and executed by this point. Yeah, it's not the most ideal animation, but we're certainly heading in the right direction. I give this one a cautious thumbs up. So now we hit our first missing episode animation, with the 2D cartoony aesthetic standing in for the missing visuals of parts 1 and 4 of The Invasion. Cosgrove Hall returned to helm this project, which in 2006 was probably the best move. They translate their serviceable technique pretty well to the grayscale tone of the Troughton era. One may assume that making an animation for black and white would cost it some of its eye-catching appeal when you can't rely on vibrant colours, but the animation team liven it up with some snappy editing and inventive camera angles that still feel relatively faithful to the filming techniques of the surviving episodes. The character movements themselves are a bit smoother, the lip syncing especially is more accurate and articulate to the dialogue, and as for the character art, the line is definitely much cleaner and crisper, which I approve of. The art style also seems a little bit more photorealistic in comparison to Cosgrove's previous work, probably to make it feel as cohesive to the surviving episodes as possible. The aforementioned silhouette technique is still played here on occasion, but again, that and some of the gloomy environment art work surprisingly well with the conspiratorial tone of the story. There's some great direction in this animation too, and action scenes are represented pretty effectively, especially the helicopter scene. Yeah, this is more like it lads, I definitely give this one a more enthusiastic thumbs up. Cosgrove Hall seemed to be on a roll with these Doctor Who animations, and apparently the BBC agreed, because they then set creatives involved with them to work on an animation for the then current era of the show. The Infinite Quest was broadcast as part of Totally Doctor Who's lineup, and it basically doubles up as an extra episode of Series 3, but just as a cartoon instead of live, obviously. The Cosgrove art style as we've come to recognise it is still very much present, but it's also been drastically advanced. Character animations are much, much smoother and cleaner on this occasion. Lighting effects are more commonly implemented, akin to how they would be in the Revival Era episodes, and there's even some 3D cell shaded elements in there, particularly with the robotic and insectoid characters. I actually really enjoy this style a fair bit, and I wouldn't have minded more Doctor Who animations depicted through it, whether it was for more missing episode projects or for the current era. <sighs> Alas, this is where 2D animations kind of vanish from the franchise for a bit. So I guess culturally, by the end of the 2000s, we all just wanted to move away from 2D animation and start doing 3D. I mean, just look at Disney's output at the time. And, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I have practiced 3D animation, and I admire anyone's attempt at making their own. Thing is, though, there's certainly a way of going about it, and this really isn't it. So, like, look, I get that they wanted to go for a stylized approach. Fair enough. After all, if one were to go to the effort to digitally recreate David Tennant photorealistically down to the smallest detail, at that point you might as well just get the real David Tennant in to perform for you. So I can see why they went in this more outlandish cartoony direction. But oh dear lord, the animation itself is so amateurish. Why is everyone in this story so stiff and robotic? 
You make the stylistic choice to give a Doctor Who episode an over-the-top cartoonish aesthetic, and yet the character movements and direction don't complement that design choice. If you're gonna go cartoony and exaggerated, go cartoony and exaggerated, you know? But I've literally seen the live-action 10th Doctor stories go more over-the-top than this. Also, the character designs are just but ugly. As I said, going stylized isn't a bad idea, but like, these things are in that awkward uncanny valley where they're not photorealistic, and yet they're also not exaggerated enough, so they just look weird. The alien designs fare a little better, but they just come off as generic, and the lighting makes all the humanoid characters look like they have jaundice. If I can compliment anything, the environment work is honestly fairly competent, pretty poor texturing in some places, but the model construction is solid stuff. By the way, y'all should check out Tom's reviews of the Infinite Quest and dreamland. Ooh, ooh. But anyway, that's enough of me tearing this story to shreds, uh, let's move on. So, y'all aware of Big Finish, that audio production company? Well, occasionally they dabble in visual content, usually for promotion of their aforementioned audios, and in 2010 they created a 3D 10 minute animation for their Bernie Summerfield range. And let me just say, this is how you do a stylized 3D animation. The cartoon version of Benny is actually somewhat pleasant to look at, and she is textured and rigged pretty nicely too. The animation could have done with perhaps a little more fluidity, but as it stands it's pretty impressive and all of Benny's reactions, body language and movements feel natural enough to be believable, and yet also exaggerated enough to be entertaining as a cartoon. I adore both the lighting effects on the environment and on the robot, as well as the fluidity of the camera movements and the sublime usage of depth of field. Even the little things like the hologram effects and the cloth motion on Braxia Tell's banner at the start are just delicious. And the environments are all lush as well. My only major critique is that the lip syncing isn't the best. But the short doesn't have that much speaking parts anyway, so that drawback isn't too major. I kind of wish Big Finish would do more of this, because they turned out to be surprisingly competent at it. So, how about them video games? I'm technically stretching the definition of animations here, considering these are interactable third-person adventure games, but you know, they have cutscenes where control is taken away from the player so you can watch virtual representations of people interact. That's a bit like a regular old animation, isn't it? The most notable examples in this category are the adventure game series and the Eternity Clock, and they both kind of have the opposite problems to each other. The character models in the adventure games are pretty well constructed if you ask me. They went for a more photorealistic approach, and I dare say they captured the likenesses of Smith and Gillen relatively well. No, with pretty decent texturing to boot. The trouble is, the animations are pretty awkward and stiff. The animators tried their best to replicate Smith's mannerisms, but the movements are all weirdly underplayed when you consider just how lively and active the 11th Doctor is in his television episodes. The fact that they keep looping the idol animations in some moments doesn't help with the awkwardness, and combined with Smith's weirdly calm and morose line delivery, it makes this 11th Doctor feel very lethargic and different to the one we see on TV. The Eternity Clock, meanwhile, opted to have Smith and Kingston perform in mocap suits, with the movements of the 11th Doctor and River's character models being dictated directly from their real-life actors. As a result, the character movement comes out far better and more natural, so there is an improvement. Only issue is, this time, the models are kinda ugly. Granted I can still tell who they're meant to be, but some of the facial features need work. And why do they have Muppet mouths when they talk? It's really distracting. The games were definitely onto something, and if you combine the strengths of both, you would probably have something special. They're hit and miss in short. So, to accompany Miracle Day, the fourth series of Torchwood, a motion comic styled animation was released to tie into it, entitled Web of Lies. Finally, we return to the 2D aesthetic four years after the franchise had dropped it. Oh dear god, this is terrible. This is a prime example of how, just because an animation is smoother, that doesn't automatically mean it's better. In fact, it's so fluid that watching it genuinely makes me feel queasy, and the sloppy off-pace editing really makes the experience feel worse. Granted, the character likenesses are relatively good, and the overall moody aesthetic has its appeal even if the backgrounds look kind of lazily done, but this thing still gave me a headache when I watched it. I mean, props to it, it gives you exactly what it says on the tin. It does feel like a comic book brought to life, but... 
no, no, sorry, re-render this thing. It's, it's something about it is just skin crawlingly off. Thumbs down. So, we're gonna conclude for now with this thing. Which, by the way, I had no idea existed until I was researching animated projects for this video. Why did the Matt Smith era opt to do so many, like, shorts and minisodes and things? There were so many of them, and I'm still discovering new ones to this day. The animation isn't as bad this time around, but there is some weird off-putting 3D motion applied to 2D graphics which just looks kinda ugly. The backgrounds are fine, but seem rather bland, and the particle effects don't really mesh well with any of it. If I can compliment anything, it's that the character illustrations are solid, with Amy, Rory, and the Tesselector looking pretty spot on. I don't really know why they bothered though. This doesn't really enhance its parent episode any further outside of superfluous spectacle. So now that brings us to 2013. Not only a momentous year for the franchise as a whole, but also a big turning point for the animations. But we'll leave that for another video. Stay tuned for part two sometime soon. I don't know when. Can I host that one? Oh my god! <laughs>